chapter 10, the supply teacher. I've always had a sneaking admiration for supply teachers. They are the cowboys in the world of education. They come into school. There's a shootout. They move on to the next school, the next town, the next deputy. Sometimes they don't even say goodbye. The most impressive type of supply teacher is the one who doesn't want to be a teacher at all. He or she is really doing the head a favour by just being there. For them, teaching represents a temporary interruption in their progress towards some higher goal. One such gentleman arrived late one morning at a school in Hackney and introduced himself in deep theatrical tones to the head and deputy thus. I am an actor. His audience appeared overawed by his presence. They offered him coffee and a seat, as if overwhelmed with gratitude for his very existence. He was allowed to smoke. They listened with rapt attention while he regaled them with tales of his theatrical triumphs. No one even suggested that he might do any teaching. Before the head and deputy had awoken from their trance, he'd gone claiming that he could not possibly be late for an absolutely vital audition for the National. I've no doubt he claimed a full day's pay for his trouble. Then there is the cynic. This person plays fast and loose with the system. I met one such who deliberately chose a different school to attend every day. He always arrived at eleven in the morning, with excuses about the appalling public transport or the dreadful traffic jams. By then, he told me, the head would have sorted out the worst of the cover problems and there would not be much work for him to do. One or two lessons and a lot of coffee and staff room chat later, he would reach the end of the day and put in his pay claim. How long he got away with this, I do not know. But there were a great many schools in London. Perhaps he is currently working in Glasgow, Newcastle, Liverpool, Toronto, Mexico City or... Some supply teachers are so full of blarney that they can talk themselves into situations in which they would really rather not be. One such was Mr. MacLeod, the most charming drifter you could ever imagine. MacLeod convinced the head that he could do anything. He was rapidly promoted from supply to permanent teacher to head of the English department in the space of a month. He liked to go drinking after school and his new responsibilities were not going to alter that. He was also fond of parties, where he was ever a popular figure. He arrived at one of these arm in arm with a 17-year-old girl whom he had encountered at a nearby bus stop. She was wearing a T-shirt with the sentence, I love Evelis inscribed thereon. A few weeks later, MacLeod disappeared. No explanation, no apology. He just stopped coming to work. The school no longer had a head of English. It took months to find another. The regular staff was not best pleased. Many years later, I bumped into him in a pub in Earl's Court. I asked him what had happened to him. I had some business to see to in Dublin. Pressing family stuff, you know. 
And now? I inquired. Oh, doing a spot of teaching uh, here and there, wherever they need me. Here, let me buy you a drink. Needless to say, I accepted. I just had to listen to more of his stories. Many such characters floated through the schools, all in some oblique way contributed to the life of the places they were in, if only by helping students appreciate their normal teacher a little bit more. Most supplies had been around a bit, and were not only able to entertain students and staff with a wealth of fascinating stories, but they could also impart a different philosophy or approach to life. Before the universality of the motor car, travelling salesmen could work the same magic in remote communities, where they could be found drink in hand in the saloon bar of the pub, entrancing locals with tales of Birmingham, Luton, Reading, and on a long evening, pastry. for the Saudis, recruiting labour in Southeast Asia. He'd worked in the Gulf, India, Burma and Indonesia. Much of his time had been spent in charming old hotels such as Raffles in Singapore. Unfortunately, his working life had tended to centre around the bar from which he used to telephone his local contacts. By the time Patrick was 32, his liver had shrunk to the size of a prune and he needed to think about a different way to earn his living. I used to sit next to Patrick with the other supply teachers in the staff room at Cardinal Pole School. We seemed to have our own little corner and it was there that discussions about politics, literature, philosophy and the arts emerged at lunch times. Occasionally, some of the other teachers found a minute or two in which they could participate in these discussions, but increasingly they were becoming weighed down with reports, lesson plans, tests, marking and departmental meetings. I did not envy them. Another contributor was a Mr Bidam. He had been at one time a well-known lawyer, notable for representing the IRA in the 70s, he had also worked in Nigeria and Kenya. He was a profoundly erudite and well-informed man who loved to talk about philosophy, politics, history and, after he'd had a few drinks, sex. After school was over, his custom was to roam the bars and clubs of London drinking and talking till the small hours. At dawn, he would walk back to his home in Stamford Hill quoting poetry and reciting extracts from Joyce. Some of the children didn't really understand Mr Bidam, but others learnt from him many things that may not necessarily be found in the national curriculum. During one of our many conversations in the staff room, two Pakistani supply teachers began talking to each other in Urdu. Patrick and Mr Bidam listened carefully and after a few minutes, stated that they could recognise some of the Urdu words. It transpired that these words were the same in Gaelic. Soon the four men had drawn up a list of 30 words that were identical in both languages. I was listening to a practical demonstration of the connection between two Indo-European languages separated by thousands of miles. We wondered what other connections could be found in the two cultures. Before we got too carried away, the bell went, and it was time to go to class. There were, of course, some real oddballs who drifted through the staff room for a while. There was the man in braces, who was very fat, 
unshaven, and who sweated profusely every time he moved from his seat. He would fall asleep in break and had to be woken when the bell went. He grunted like a hippo, rising from the mud and heaving and sweating would make his way to the classroom. Would he make it back to the staff room? Odds were declared, bets were made. He always did, at least until the day when he didn't make it into the school at all. Then there was the one they called Rasputin. This was because he looked and dressed exactly like the Mad Monk. Survival tips for supply teachers. 1. Make sure the deputy knows that your real profession is the law, the stage, medicine, or whatever you can think of. Let him understand that he or she, a mere teacher, is lucky to have you there at all. Remember, the deputy needs you more than you need him or her. 2. Join a union and know all the union rules regarding numbers of pupils in the classroom, health and safety, etc. If you don't, you may find yourself taking three classes at once in the assembly hall. 3. Go to the head of department for every lesson you have been asked to cover and demand cover work, preferably within earshot of the head. 4. Be totally unpleasant to the first child you see. The other children will enjoy this, but will assume you are mad and therefore dangerous. Children have the good sense to obey such people without question. Slip the child you have persecuted a fiver at the end of the day. Apologise and explain that you mistook him or her for someone who had once disobeyed you in your previous school. 5. If you are really serious about keeping order, get a list of parents' mobile numbers. 6. Carry a mobile phone. Do not be afraid to use it in class, if only to chat up someone in the staff room. Let the children think you are phoning the deputy, their mother, the chief of police. 7. Talk as little as possible in class. Keep a pad on which you should pretend to be making notes about behaviour. 8. Know the time that the bell goes for the end of the lesson. 9. Do not walk around the room. Sit down at all times, at the teacher's desk or table at the front of the class. Stare at them like a snake watching a mouse. 10. Take the children's names in relation to where they're sitting. Viz. Person at desk 1 is Beverly. When person at desk 1 twitches, as they're bound to do within 10 minutes, bellow out, Beverly, are you totally incapable of keeping still? The children will be impressed by your astonishing memory the power of your voice and the fact that you have picked on Beverly without due cause. 11. When confronted with a gun or knife, tell them to put it away just as if it were bubble gum. If this doesn't work, leave the room and don't stop running. 12. Never try to break up a fight. When a full-scale riot breaks out, remember that you are not paid danger money and leave by the nearest exit. If you obey these rules, you may stand a small chance of surviving as a supply teacher for more than a week. On the other hand... Oh, 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 o